Hi everyone, um, and welcome to the DOCUS conference uh, for this year that's uh, focused on exploring uh, locally led uh, development. I hope you're all feeling very inspired uh, from the videos that we saw there. And uh, I would like to thank especially our um, members for uh, contributing to that because I think it's a very powerful way to start um, our conference today and to hear uh, from you about some of the efforts that you're doing uh, with regards to progressing locally led development. And I think one of the reasons we wanted to focus the conversation or the conference on this particular topic is that last year, I suppose, we, we identified that this was an area or piece of work that DOCUS wanted to work on collectively, that our members wanted to come together and try to explore collectively and uh, try to identify how best we can move forward in this discussion and how we can actually bring that back down to our practices every day in our organizations as well. So um, I won't speak for too long. I'll just go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have a lot of participants um, on the call today. So I would ask that everybody um, mutes their audio but keeps the video on. It would be really um, helpful if you could also uh, change uh, your name. I suppose those three dots, I think, in the corner of, of your screen where you should be able to adjust to include your full name um, and your organization. Um, please feel free at any stage uh, to push questions and comments in the chat as well. Um, there will be opportunities in the plenary sessions, obviously, to put your hands up, but um, you can do the comments at any time or questions. And this session will be recorded and shared publicly. Um, the group work itself will not be recorded, but for any of the general sessions that we have here in this space, we will record to share, uh, share with members and, and for our website. And also, uh, we might be have group shots that are shared online as well that hopefully you'll smile for. And there is closed captioning available um, if you would uh, like to avail of that. So um, I just want to introduce um, a couple of um, our both our facilitator and our keynote speaker uh, for today. Um, so firstly, I'll just uh, introduce our facilitator, Smriti Patel. Uh, so Smriti has been working with us over the last couple of weeks um, designing this conference, and uh, she comes with a wealth of experience and knowledge. So she is the founder and co-director of the Global Mentoring Initiative, and is an active advocate for locally led response and accountability to affected populations. So in her role, she's involved in co-creating spaces to help NGOs and donors in the change process for better partnerships, collaborations, for shifting power, attitudes and behaviors, and for keeping equity, inclusion, anti-racism and decolonization at the center of the discussion. And she was involved in the research to develop uh, lo the localization framework for the START network. Um, and she currently works with networks and donors across Europe and elsewhere to support them in their work towards locally led development. Um, so that is Smriti who will be taking over from the facilitation. So you won't have to listen to me all day. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say a word, Smriti, of hello. No, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions and taking forward some concrete discussions around what needs to move. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Smriti. Um, and then we'll, uh, I will introduce now our keynote speaker, uh, Shurnor Ba. Uh, so Shurnor is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Purposeful. And Purposeful describes itself as a feminist hub for girls' activism rooted in Africa and working all around the world. So Shurnor is a feminist activist who's dedicated his life to building the power and amplifying the voices of girls and young people across the world and in Sierra Leone. Uh, when he was just 15, he founded the Children's Forum Network, a mass movement of children who organized and mobilized to ensure their voices were included, were included in the peace and reconciliation efforts after the civil war in Sierra Leone. And he's an expert advisor to the Security Council on Youth, Peace and Security. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, that he's here with us today to share some of his thoughts and perspectives on locally led development. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to you, Shanor. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
and uh, and thank you, thanks, thanks to all of you for for having me. Um, it is a it is really an honor uh, for me to join this important meeting of DOCAS and to have the privilege of addressing you. I was thinking about my first visit to Europe about two decades ago as a child rights activist. Actually, took me to Dublin, where I spent time uh, with Plan Ireland and help them set up their first children's advisory panel. I do have some absolutely fond memories of Irish hospitality, even though I should say as a teenager, fresh from Sierra Leone, I did struggle to fully grasp your beautiful accent then. I should also commend Dorcas for taking on this important and urgent topic of locally led development or localization as a priority at this conference and in the work that you all do globally. As the co-lead of Purposeful, an African-based feminist global organization interested in reimagining and remaking the world, this is definitely a subject that has occupied mine and our mind a lot. And I'm ha very happy today to share some of what I'm hoping will be provoking and uncomfortable thoughts with you. So let me get right into it. As I prepared for this presentation, I was stuck to learn that one of the challenges of a concept in many of the reports I was reviewing is that it's actually been difficult to grasp the concrete meaning for many people who mean well and are trying to do something about it. So I thought maybe I could start by describing what locally led development is not. So imagine for a second, and I'm gonna take you on a, on a rather wild, journey that me, a Muslim Black African male from Sierra Leone, acquired some wealth from, let's say, some questionable means. And I decided that I will use my fortune to save the people of Ireland. I fly to Dublin, armed with my perfect ideas of how to develop the people of your country and conduct an assessment using the tools that I have imported and standards that were used in my village. I decided that the problem is so severe that you don't understand my language, you don't understand the system, your systems are so different that I should set up a massive office in your city, import the biggest SUVs, bring experts from the villages of Sierra Leone to come develop the capacity of the Irish group so they will learn not just how to report to me by my own rules and standards, but also do so only in my important treasured local language. I thought the Irish would particularly appreciate the, the idea of an, an imported uh, language. I decide as well that the local groups I'm working with who understand their community and have different set of expertise should nonetheless spend time building their own accountability systems in the image of the Sierra Leone style. And just to make sure, since according to some, the Irish cannot be so trusted, I have to conduct unannounced spot checks demand multiple written text reports, complex financial report with receipts, et cetera, to just make sure that this money that, by the way, I'm giving from the goodness of my heart is spent in the interest of the Irish. Now, I could take this story further and further on, but when you think about it, it sounds like an incredibly absurd proposition that neither treats the Irish with respect, solidarity, and dignity nor from the most basic common sense will this be a recipe that will lead to anything other than a model of development that may be appropriate or right for Sierra Leone and the village and community that I come from, but will be so outlandish in an Irish context. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, by no fault of any of us, I admit, that absurd system is what I believe we have today as the global development industry. I think we can all agree that it's a system that is constructed on, yes, racist, colonial assumptions about power and abilities of black, black and brown people. It continues to assume that global aid is somehow not a feature of our common humanity and based on solidarity. And in some cases, even born out of the necessity to atone for and restitute for past wrongs, but too often as charity for people presented in our reports and media as almost subhuman without agency, without history, and without power. We're having this conversation because I know 
that we all know that this system, this that is not localization, that is not locally led development, because that's what the status quo is, it's not right. And I know that you share that. And we're dedicated towards changing it. Whenever I talk about it, everybody says, so how do we do it? How do we change it? Let me offer some ideas. At Purposeful, we've been asking ourselves these questions a lot and seeking to be in communion with our partners and allies and not just advocating this radical shift that are needed, but also embodying them. The first and often complicated area is our relationship with money. We do provide grants and awards to registered, excuse me, and unregistered feminist activists and girls across the world in ways that they need and, 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 and want. We sometimes move this money without a requirement of complex formalized applications. We accept WhatsApp audio applications and I've even called groups and recorded their submissions. We know that money is power. The, 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 the world is constructed around the idea of money is power. And we understand that we're only custodians of the resources we're privileged to hold. We're therefore committed to redistributing those resources. And we call it that to the groups that need them the most and are oftentimes intentionally marginalized from these resources. And yes, the funds are unrestricted. And every time we speak about this, immediately ask about, oh my God, that sounds so risky. Of course, you know, the paternalistic notion that, you know, money in the hands of girls and feminist activists is risky. We take a stance that girls and activists are worth the risk. And in fact, what we end up seeing with these resources is truly locally led development as they chat their own path of personal and community liberation. Of course, we do not conduct spot checks and our relationships are based on trust and mutual respect. We convene spaces where we all share strategies and groups can share pictures, videos, and written updates, and they do so with joy as they see fit because we start from a place of solidarity, mutual respect, and trust. All features that I dare say are desperately often missing in my experience in this development space. We can't talk about liberation in terms of money that we give out alone. We also think about our internal structure as well. Purposeful is proudly headquartered in Sierra Leone, rooted here and sometimes working with allies in places as far as Ukraine, Afghanistan, Palestine. Development too often is assumed in a lateral direction flowing from the north to the south. The assumptions inherent in that hegemonic narrative fuels our designation of what is local and international. Staff, the racist and colonized pay scales that somehow purport to take context into consideration, but conveniently ignores the context of who has access to generational wealth, added family responsibility, access to great healthcare and education. Those are not part of this context that is considered on what pay scales are determined and who has access to what resources or not. These assumptions are the basis upon which most of our organizations and our relationships with local partners are based. We desire for our salaries to be paid with full benefits, but you know, the local partners, they can only spend 10% of these really small shaky grants we're giving them on overheads. These notions are even portrayed as progressive. Organizations advertise, all our monies go to direct beneficiaries. The claim is made, but the reality is it means local labor is employed that is barely and definitely not justly compensated. We've created a structure that speaks to the public about, 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 about this in this way and portrayed it as a value. We have done the same. We're working to overturn these assumptions and build one global team of colleagues across eight countries but all just part of one team. What is also called localization of development assistance is often not really about local groups. You know, I always think about what we're seeing now after the World Humanitarian Summit and the consensus that major global organizations with a mission to end inequity and injustice in the world, and now under this new localization wave, 
leaders of this major global organization set up local subsidiaries in groups, hire local leaders, open local offices, and have a local strategy. And these organizations are now considered local and actually taking off resources that are meant to go to truly local organizations. Now, creation of local subsidies and, 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 and local organizations in these countries is important, but that cannot be a substitute for what we're talking about in this localization discourse. Because we know that these organizations, that core funding still goes to or through parent organizations, which ultimately also sets the strategy and the relationships continue to be. So it's not deeply rooted in the idea of transforming relationships and true change. To find, fund, and support genuinely local organizations, members of your network, all of us need to think about these groups where they are and not just try as some do to recreate them in our image. As I said in my absurd story of trying to create Irish groups and organizations and community development in the image and systems of how a Sierra Union village will think about community and development. The way you can avoid the risk of what I sometimes jokingly refer to as foxcalization instead of neocalization. And foxcalization is what I call, it's just a neocolonial approach that switches the language but it's still stuck in old ways of doing things. So it's just tinkers on the edges. Friends, COVID has dramatized for the absurdity of all of this system. It's demonstrated the unsustainable nature of the industry we've created, one that relies on diminishing local talent and power and emphasizing white Western colonized structures. I am here in this conversation. I know you've invited me because you believe that this system needs to change. And I believe we can organize together across the Atlantic, across the North and South divide and imagine a new reality together. One that is based on trust, respect, solidarity and our common humanity. We can think differently, think about ways to look at impact and think about ways to look at power. Reflect about the relationship we have with our funders and those you fund. Because in your position collectively, you can also demand even these rules, because oftentimes I hear that, oh, these rules come from funders. But you have power. And this is what I say to even our local groups here. If we come together and demand, we will not take your money. And that's what somebody thinks we're doing our purpose for. We will not take your money if it treats us somehow as less than human or imposes standards that we believe are inconsistent with our values. Are these relationships based on trust? Are we true partners? Is relationship equal? And there's a move now with some philanthropies from grants to gifts, like giving with fair strings, strings attached. I think we've all seen some of the news of some of this money that's been given away. Is that a better way to share power? I think that's important to continue to explore. And how do we shift power within your organizations or outside your organizations? And a bigger final question, should your organization even exist? Because... If we're not willing to ask ourselves, should your role, your organization, as currently constructed, even be in existence? If we're ready to ask that question or to walk towards making our institutions and our individual roles today, to walk them out of existence, that is what real localization will look like, a clear strategy to say, the way we are currently existed, we work ourselves out of that and not what I've called fox, foxcalization. These are, I know, uncomfortable, tough questions, but these are questions that I believe relay the burning needs of this conversation that we must have and the structure that we have inherited by no fault of ours, but that we are all part of just by our existence. I don't know the answers to these questions, but I know that these questions need to be asked. And I'm hoping that in our conversations and in your efforts to even convene this and in your willingness, we all grapple with the difficulty of this and find the solutions together. Thank you again for having me and good luck with this deliberation.
Wow. What powerful journey you've taken us on. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience, but also taking us on a journey of reflection on how um, we are working and with what values um, and for what purpose, right? Uh, really, really important reflections. And um, I must say, <laughs> your starting point was so, <clears throat> so good, <laughs> putting us in the opposite position to really get us thinking. So thank you so much for that. Um, so I want to open the floor to, to you all. Uh, what are some of the questions, reflections you have from li listening to Sharon and what he's actually um, challenged us on? Any, any reflections, any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, please uh, put your hand up on, uh, from the reactions button um, and also in the chat if you would like. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think I have Carol already. Thank you, Carol. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you so much, you know, that was absolutely fantastic and really inspirational to listen to. And I think the questions, you know, maybe they're uncomfortable, but they're very, very welcome, I think, because these are the types of questions that I think we need to explore. So I just want to thank you so much for such a, a really inspirational input. I mean, one of the kind of the questions that I have for you is, we've been talking this morning a little bit at the AGM about the challenges that we face in the world today in relation to climate change, economic inequality, structural inequality. And I fear that we're, you know, we're, we just have so many challenges to deal with. And we were talking about, you know, the focus on ODA and, you know, should we be saying the Irish public should support ODA because, you know, then things will be better in five years, but things might be worse because of the structural and systemic issues that largely the global north has created and is not addressing sufficiently. So climate change being a really strong example of that. So one of the, the really important questions for us, I think, and you put it on the table. So where are we going as a sector and what is our role in a European context? And I take from what you're saying, you know, so the first point we exist, we're here, and um, most people are here because they believe in the change and they believe in human rights and they believe in equality. So that's, you know, the reality we're here. But what you've brought up, I think, is the really how we do our business and how we look at money, how we look at power. There, that's the first thing we can really address. And I think the examples you've given are really strong. And I think it's really important as well that what you've raised about is where should we be in the future? So if we're working that we don't exist as we do today, how do we how do we get there in a world of such structural inequality and the reality that things are getting worse in many ways and i think the other thing a question for me is you know what is the transformation for us in the global north is it more that our role is holding northern power brokers to account for the damage and the destruction that the north has played in the south and i think it has been raised i mean there are structural issues that affect people in the north inequality is growing here as well and has been for years so there's you know there's making that connection that these are global structural issues as well but you know before we get to the step of you know not being here which is you know and how do we get there is something to really tease out but where what should we shift in the meantime should it be that stronger focus on really saying you know we need to address our role and our power Thank you. Um, any other questions? And then um, uh, just think about that, Sean. And uh, if there are any others, then we will take it now. Um, anybody else would like to pose a question, share reflection? OK, uh, Sean, over to you. So. Keep thinking, and if you do have questions, also put it in the chat. Meanwhile, Sharon can answer the question that was just posed. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, I don't really have the answers. I think those, those questions you posed and reflections are great. And I think I really, um, as I said, I, I, I really important that you are having this conversation in the first place, which is the place to start and an acknowledgement that you know, the system that are currently constructed and maybe the assumptions that are in the system are problematic. They are based on, a, you know, we, we, we inherited the system. We inherited a system of 
ways of working, ways of doing business. And um, but I, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking around, uh, you know, what what could the responsibilities of, as you said, organizations in the global north be, and how different could those that relationship be? For example, in in a in a, in a different context, in a, in a in a more just and equitable way. I don't think. What I advocate is not to get rid of overseas developments, obviously, is to just acknowledge what the foundations of that is and to question our own power. So structurally as well, ask ourselves how we show up, you know, what assumptions we're making about money, because money says a lot, but who access to have access to what and, and where. And how do we even hold our countries to account on um, the way that they spend overseas developments? You know, I I we're all in solidarity with uh, Ukraine, and we're we as purposeful are actually actually moving money to activist groups in Ukraine as well, um, and and who are affected by that. But you can see right there inequality and injustice in the world. You know, I we're not far away from Cameroon. We have friends in 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 Ethiopia and other conflicts and crisis settings that have been ignored completely. You know, I was very heartened to see the United States. Um, government just two days ago, I think, passed about a $40 billion aid to Ukraine. That's remarkable. And that's great. That money is not aid. That's money that they're giving directly to actually support building institutions and infrastructure of Ukraine. That's going to the military and building that. But it's almost unimaginable that they will do that for countries that are dominated by black and brown bodies. And I think you know, so even the nature of that conversation. So our industry exists to say when you're giving aid, you know, yeah, you can give, and then they create all these parameters that are, again, kind of really based on all these assumptions about who we are, and we cannot be trusted with money. It's the same assumptions, you know, um, but that's not true, you know. And 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 as you know, the evidence doesn't support that. There was widespread corruption all over the world, including the big. Debates in Ukraine leading up to the elections was also about corruption. Big debates in um, mo- multiple countries in Canada was about corruption. In the US, it's about corruption. But somehow, the corruption of black and brown bodies is kind of elevated into a way that prohibits us from even having access to resources and a path to chart our way. So, even challenging that notion as development partners and saying, okay, what is aid? What is development resource? What's the nature of that relationship between us and the countries that we're in partnership with and we're in solidarity with? And I think that's a place to start. But then, as we've said as well, I think as institutions, just structurally, the way we are set up, it's a big, big problem. And, and we, as purposeful, as I said, we have, you know, we, we, when we got, we, we, you know, we started from a premise of decolonization and all of that, but we, we realized that unwittingly, we were creating a, a system that frankly mirrors how most of the organizations are because we want to be a global player as well. And the way you become a global player, you set up an office in London, you set up an office in New York, you pay experts in a certain way. I mean, it's a, it's a system that's crooked. It's rigged. <laughs> and, you know, until you start and be like, oh, wait, wait, all of a sudden I have a different pay scale. Where I have people I pay less who actually do the same work or whose work are valued differently. I'm valuing people who have a certain kind of education, who speak with a certain accent over other people. And those are the structural conversations that we might have. And I think organizations in the global north have a lot of power mm. to shift that um, conversation it can have a lot of impact in a country like Sierra Leone like if the global partner if development actors come together and have a a a consensus it affects every aspect of our lives our governments because they are the biggest players here but we still start with and allow these assumptions in terms of how that relationship is and who's expert and who is not who has money who does not how the money is given what the flows of that so I, I know that doesn't really answer your question but those are the thoughts I can offer. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I think you've given them more food for thought, and especially around these structural issues of racism, also assumptions, right? And double standards in the way, looking at black and brown against the others. And that question around, um, you know, you said about corruption, we've seen this in the COVID response, when you see also a situation in the UK, 
the, all the questions around corruption right. that's going on, right? So all of us have that in, in the different countries. Thanks for bringing that up, because that's so important. Uh, Bobby, you have something, please. Yeah, thank you. That, that was such a wonderful contribution and, and very much needed. And, and just to thank thank Cherna for that. I just wanted to mention, I, I put it into the chat space, but it is interesting to me as, as someone who works within an organization that has been very active for many years in global citizenship education or development education, that these types of stories and examples have been shared for, for many years. And there seems to be a, a kind of a structural reluctance amongst many of the NGOs that are represented here today to, to look beyond, I suppose, just these examples from an input point of view and actually do something about it at a, at a deeper level organizationally. Um, you know, and, and I think that, that that nettle needs to be grappled by, by all of us in, in this space that, you know, so many of the organizations here spend little or nothing, financially speaking, on global citizenship education, on development education. And I think that that's a real shame and a missed opportunity and, and I would encourage uh, many of the organizations that don't look at that aspect of their work to really try to begin to embed it, to deal with the structural inequalities that are alive and well, sadly, and mm -hmm. to really try to address the root causes of many of the, the inequalities that face people right across the world. So just to thank uh, Cherna for the contribution again, really valuable, really needed, but I would urge the membership of DOCUS to take the field of development education or global citizenship education much more seriously because we've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Olive, please, would you, do you have a question or reflection? Sure. And um, thank you. Um, I guess what's really striking me as I listen to this is Whereas it's so, we have been having these conversations for a while now. I think they've become more mainstream and it's brilliant that we're in this space now, but there, there's not like these conversations have been had and, you know, we've heard this for so long and many of us are grappling with this. And I really question and wonder, are we capable of that transformation? Because I do think it's been quite slow within the sector that we're in. And I have heard this for a long time. And some of the real fundamental issues around power and money and resources um, and if we are capable of that transformation, that pace is very, very slow. And when you want change, you know, you either have change from within, which is what we're talking about here. How do we transform? How do we change from within? Or you step out and you tear down and you start again and you, and, and I suppose that's the question I have in my mind when I hear this, I'm going, you know, are we kidding ourselves a little bit to be very honest? And because if it's so hard for us to transform as a sector, that's so engaged in all of this and trying to be reflective and learn. And we want to change the political systems and the business systems in the same way. And we find it so hard. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, rev <laughs> the revolution or something more radical, but I am really challenged by some of these conversations around what's it really going to take? You know, yeah, that's just a reflection, but sorry. <laughs> Sharon, your reaction to the reflection, please. Oh, I, I do love that uh, reflection. Uh, I purposefully we do uh, what we call radical reading in uh, every, every couple of weeks and we choose a text and we have these reflections. And yesterday's conversation, uh, we were having exactly this um, debate about what it's going to take, you know. And I'm struck oftentimes when I'm in conversations with people who agree with us. Um, theoretically. So as you said, these kind of conversations are not new. As I said, I've been, um, again, in, in and around development space and worked at different levels for quite a few years myself. So I consider myself part of this destructive system, um, trying, I hope, actively to overturn it. But it's always struck, struck me that we have these conversations with folks, and then we talk about concrete ways of changing it. And folks quickly go, oh, but that will destabilize things. You quickly see the discomfort of, it will be out of order. You know, you have to still just tick all the boxes. And that I, we were saying to our team yesterday that we exist to destabilize. 
we are purposeful. We, that's why we exist. It's like, oh, you can't be moving money like that. Actually, yes, you can't be moving money like that. Oh, who's going to know who has the money? Actually, that's the point. Nobody should know who has the money. Like, you know, I, I, I think that the reason this is so slow is we want to, as you said, use the old container that was basically, this container is created to sustain itself. Mm. This colonized, very hierarchical, kind of not south unilateral flow of this organization is created. We exist to self perpetuate. That's why, despite our great efforts, I don't think that um, many countries will put up their hands and say, oh, because of this aid industry, this is why our countries have completely transformed. I know that's not entirely fair because it's not like we have access to all the resources that we need. But still, I think as a system, as a structure, it's our discomfort with anything beyond the, the norm, you know? So people agree with you. Mm-hmm. It's one of the disadvantages of this conversation. We can have this conversation. You all theoretically agree. But if I say now, you know, uh, maybe let's completely get rid of your role and let's get black and brown people, you know, oh, you have an office on localization and partnership. Actually, that should be led not by you. It should be led by, should be based there. Oh, and they should be paid, by the way, the same money you are paid. That's when it gets tricky, yeah? <laughs> they should get the same services and facilities that you get. That's when it gets tricky. It's like, oh, but you know, we're going to disrupt the local market. Yeah. Hello. When you arrive, you disrupted the local markets. You show up in SUVs. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like you get paid all that money. You just show, like you're playing God yeah. in that. But I think until we're willing to move that and on unrestricted resources, again, that's so, um, it, it's seen as such a, people get really, oh, you know, how can we give unrestricted resources? Because yeah, we have to account for it. No, you don't. Like you can account for it differently. But it's a system you created. You can create it different. Yeah. system of accountability so i i agree with you and i and i am I, I listen i'm generally in favor of just scrapping the entire system and starting all over that's my instinct but i also kind of know that i actually also run a formal organization that's registered and um <laughs> and, uh, and 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 i have to be in these conversations with all of you to to not start from um, a position of not even having a conversation. Because if I come and say, oh, let's just burn it all down, then we can't even have a conversation. But deep down, I, I, I do share your sentiment about, and that's kind of why we, that's why we started Purposeful. We quit, we quit. I was working in the UN in mm-hmm. big other multilateral institutions and we decided we don't work with them anymore. And most of them, we don't accept money from them anymore mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a statement. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So to bring that perspective, right, uh, to, to us and, and really helping us to start thinking. Um, and that's what I would like to bring in now. It's really concretely, because this is what you're saying, right? You need to do something. It's not just talking about these things and understanding, oh, yes, and then what, right? Um, so what we're going to do next is really start looking at that more concretely, what needs to be done. But I want to say thank you so much for opening our minds, our hearts. And actually the third thing is the will to change, right? Because without that will, (laughs) nothing is going to change. So I'm going to take that forward um, and help them to start looking concretely um, at things. So I just want to say thank you very much for, uh, for getting us here. Um, so I want to take forward the discussion that Sean has started to say, okay, now, if we really want to concretely do things and change and really uh, bring things so that we are going forward, what should we do? Um, and as Global Mentoring Initiative, we've been doing work on locally led, localization, whatever you might call it, um, in the last five, six years to say, okay, what are the, some of the key things that you need to do? Um, so we carried out huge amount of consultations with local organizations in different parts of the world. We've also done 10 country studies to see what's the state of localization, but we've used a framework to help us to do that. 
the framework came from the local organizations who work in all sorts of situations, right? At the moment, the way our sector works is we put things in silos, humanitarian, development, peace building, and all this. But for local organizations, they live in a situation and they deal with what comes, right? They don't see themselves in siloed, right? Um, so they started identifying some key things um, that will help them um, in, in terms of um, moving forward this whole uh, commitment, right, to locally led development or localization, as I think Sharon was saying. And I wanted to share with you seven dimensions that are, uh, are, were identified by them. And this was done in consultation with local organizations, INGOs and others, to just see what are the key aspects that we should be looking at. So I'm going to share that with you right now. And um, one minute, I hope it's right. You can see this? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, um, so you will see that, um, although I can't see the screen now, okay. you can see that, right? Um, so you will see, and I think Sharon um, talked about this, right? The quality of relationship, it is so, so important. And he talked about respectful and equitable relationship reciprocal transparency I, I think John talked about you know it's always one way so how do we make sure that um, we have a relationship and a, and a quality partnership where we really look at mutual uh, respect and mutual transparency and accountability and also uh, what we heard a lot is about decision making partners and there's a lot of talk about partnering and partnerships but actually, what does it mean? Normally, it just means you're a subcontractor, you know, you subcontract the partner to implement. But here we're really talking about decision-making partners, right? So the quality of relationship is really important. You might have other things that go in there, but that's one aspect, uh, one of the dimensions. The second dimension they talked about is around um, you know, participation and participation revolution, they call it, right? It's really about more deeper participation with people who are affected, uh, the people who are we are working with in the community. You know, how do, the, do you pro, um, really design projects and programs with their involvement? It was so one of the key aspects. And actually, at the moment, the way we are working, um, there's no choice uh, normally left to them to really get involved with the actual program and um, project designs in whatever they want to do. Funding and, and financing was another aspect that was identified in terms of how you should, you know, what kind of things you could do. Better quality of funding. Uh, you know, it means that, you know, provide them the funding they really need to do the programming. Normally they're on such a shoestring budget, right? So, uh, you know, really provide them overheads, provide them quality uh, and greater funding so they can, uh, they can do the things they need to do. And that is adaptive. I think um, um, already um, it was mentioned uh, to, to make sure that the organizations that are working there with the communities you know, have a good financial health to be able to continue to be sustaining themselves as well. The, the other aspect that was mentioned was about capacity. You know, um, how do you make sure that you are, you know, strengthening capacity, but whose capacity and for what, right? Uh, normally it's, it's coming from how they can fulfill your requirements rather than what they need, right? So that's another aspect you need to think about, about the whole issue of capacity. Um, what is it they require and how are we fulfilling that rather than the other way around? And I think one of the aspects that's really important now is around collaborative capacities. We've seen the kinds of you know, the challenges that are facing us now, and nobody can do it on their own. So how can we also think about collaborative capacities at country level and 
and you know support that and stop undermining capacities. Uh, Sharon, one of the key things that came up was really around um, not being able to um, sustain and maintain the staff they have. They put so much um, effort into building capacity of their staff. And as soon as this big ING arrives in the country and start expanding their operations, where do you think they get the staff from? Normally it's the local organization staff who are going the other way because of the thing about the salary that Sharon mentioned. And sorry. Um, the salary that, um, that Sharon mentioned and all the other aspects that, you know, he, he was mentioning earlier. Um, then I wanted to talk about the, the whole thing about coordination, right? When you see any kind of um, coordination that's happening in country, but also, you know, internationally, mostly it's internationals who are uh, at the table, right? So how can we make sure more national actors uh, have greater presence and influence in decisions and policy in their own countries, right? Uh, beyond just avoiding uh, duplication. So it's really, again, around collaborative capacity and impact. Um, the, the sixth one was really around policies and standards. And I think Sharon made it really good at the beginning when he said, we'll come to your country and impose our standards. <laughs> so we need to really look at the national actors and how they contribute to influencing the standards, right? That are appropriate for the, for the context they're in. And last but not least, the whole issue around visibility and credit sharing, because often um, local organizations are the ones who are really leading the response, leading the activities, but they never get any credit for their work. Um, so how can we change that? How can we make sure that, because once you share that credit and credibility, then that also builds trust. Because at the moment, for example, do your donors really know who your partners are and how much work they're doing? Actually, they're, you know, they're really accountable, but you, you know, their visibility is never there. So these are the seven dimensions that are really key to making progress on locally led. And in there also comes reflection on power. So when you talk about uh, relationship and quality of relationship, it's about power dynamics and how you're managing your power. Um, I would say another dimension in this and something that I think needs to come in, in terms of reflection, is identity and power. If you don't have those reflections within your organization around your identity and power, uh, and what kind of culture you are uh, creating, again, that also leads to uh, prejudice and uh, sometimes even discrimination against local uh, partners. So I wanted to put these seven dimensions up front to, and then get you to discuss this in smaller groups. So after this, we will be um, actually uh, splitting up into seven groups to discuss these seven dimensions and look a bit deeper into where do you think the sector is at in each of these dimensions? So you will be, uh, you will be gauging, right, from one to five, what, where do you think we are at in these seven dimensions? And then you'll be exploring further about, um, you know, where do we need to be, where are the challenges? So I'm going to stop sharing right now. Um, if you have any questions, Please, uh, please raise your hand. Otherwise, um, we will go into groups. And um, sorry, I'm just stopping this uh, presentation and I cannot see the screen. I hope, oh yeah, okay. Um, so, okay, so here, sorry. Sorry. So yeah, here are the seven groups. Here are the seven groups. So basically, if you, um, we will split up into that. Each group will have a facilitator in there and a scribe. So when you have your discussions, they will be documented. And then when you come back, you will be reporting back on the discussions. And we're going to give you 30 minutes to do that. 
Um, and you can choose your own group. And if the groups are oversubscribed, um, then you may be put in another group. So I need some help from my team here to get you into the, the smaller groups. So think about those seven dimensions and go and have your discussions. And please do add things if you need. So, um, you know, you can suggest additional things in each of the, each of the dimensions, so no problem. Uh, so please go and have your discussions and then we'll be back in 30 minutes to get your feedback. So I hope that uh, firstly, Sharon gave you some food for thought around these seven dimensions because I, I heard them all in his, <laughs> in his um, sharing with us as well. So let's see what comes back. I start? Let's, uh, let's start sharing. So, um, yeah, what were some of your reflections? And I obviously I had a, a peep into the, <laughs> into the Google Doc, so it's really interesting. Uh, so if you can share with us, like, what was the score, um, firstly, and, and then, um, you know, what were some of the discussions in there? So here, here's the jam board. So if you can, I think we need it slightly bigger so that we can see. Can everybody see that? Yes, yeah, yeah, we can see that. So um, if in your uh, group, who is going to report back, if you can just, uh, yeah, just share with us um, so that people can hear what was the discussion. And I already see, right, the, the, the score. Yeah, so um, this is Olive here from that group. So our discussion on the score was quite interesting. I mean, there was um, part of the group that started off sort of cert certainly scoring us quite low, sort of saying certainly not two, closer to one, you know, that this is such we really have some, we're, we're at a lower starting point and have some really big significant changes and transformation that we need to get to where we need to be around this. But then a few others in the group also pointed out that perhaps if you think of us as a, as a sector in Ireland comparatively to other sectors, that we do have a strong history of solidarity, of empathy, that we wouldn't necessarily be, you know, that we would be perhaps a little bit more progressive than we necessarily think we are, certainly in our rhetoric and our conversations and principles and values and that. Um, and also then a conversation around, well, it's also about well, which parts of our work, that certain parts of our work, perhaps our advocacy work, has much more of a you know reflects a better relationship quality than some other parts of our work and that again the sector is quite varied so we kind of compromised at, at just under two but really recognizing there's huge variance depending on who you're talking about and what type of work we're talking about or what type of interventions we're talking about and then on the what needs to change we had yeah quite a few different ideas a conversation starting around you know really about meaningful connections and um, dialogue and better dialogue and conversations connections for relationships with people um, but also stuff around our approach to risk and the fact that we both personally but also institutionally organizationally are so risk averse and actually we need to really shift and change that and mm -hmm. um, accountability and um, how we, you know, how we, how we carry out our accountability, how we perceive ourselves to be accountable and to who. Um, also just understanding the context, being re realistic about our expectations and all of that thing around that need for far more critical reflection and introspection. And we, in that conversation, we identified a few of the obstacles um, and I guess you can see them all there, but a lot of it again is our compliance systems, our results, our expectation of results, sort of the, the systems and the processes in which we work within. And we didn't get as far as our vision. We ran out of time. That's okay. That's okay. Because, you know, this conversation is a starting point, right? <laughs> so you will have time to think about it as, as also as, a, as the network. Um, I just want to a quick attention to what needs to change. So I think the other thing in there I would just um, get to you to think about and reflect on is, you know, even when you have the partnership agreement, for example, 
what's the language in there and how equitable is that language? Are you having reg regular reviews with your partners to talk about the relationship? We talk a lot about the financing and the programming, but do we talk about the relationship and how that's going? And I think that's a really key thing. I don't see that that so it's something around this kind of review and really looking at what's the expectation of the partner for both, right? So something that you you do that right from the start so people know what to expect. And then also around if there are problems, right? How would you solve them as well, right? If there is uh, issues, I mean, we know the different issues that come up, right? In, in both in development and any work that we're doing around exploitation or around other issues, which sometimes they don't bring up because they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. So we really need to kind of have also that kind of thinking as well in terms of what can we put in place to improve the quality of that partnership. Um, did, they, did anybody mention anything about, you know, sitting with partners to look at the relationship and reviewing? I'm sure there must be those practices, right? So these are some of the things that I think you need to think about in terms of what needs to change to make a, 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 a partnership. Um, and then in terms of what would success look like, um, that's an interesting question, whether it's something that you define or they define, right, as well. It's something perhaps to, to think about how to, how to uh, put that in, because I think it's also necessary first for you to reflect, but also to reflect with the partners, what kind of changes. And if you do reviews, you can uh, very quickly uh, come to what success would look like. Uh, good. Um, any, any thought from anybody else in that group or other group when you see this? Is there anything else you would like to add in here? Just um, for the others who are listening, when you think about partnership, because I know, I know you didn't get a chance to be in this group, uh, but is there anything that comes to mind that you would like to contribute? Silence. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's go to the next group um, and see what comes up there. So participation revolution. Please share with us. Okay, so this was, uh, this was our group um, and um, we had a very interesting discussion actually. Um, we, we are voting along the scale um we were split between two and three so we went halfway okay um that's that's where we landed um in terms of what needs to change um and yeah i need to make it a little bit bigger because i can't see it um basically um it's you know how we view the communities we work with a lot of ours is around language system structures to move away from the beneficiaries yeah. um, to look at acknowledging our biases um as organizations and um, to acknowledge that we have biases internally and you know which voices are heard when we have these discussions where do our inputs come from um are we listening to to everyone um i mean it comes up later as well um, when we get to what success looks like um even the the language we we talk about and our mindset as us and when i say us like the international ngos um, that we keep looking at the effect or at the root. We're not looking at the root causes, but looking at the effect. Um, and, you know, I suppose the, the general feeling was that our perspective needs to change, even the frameworks we use. Um, so to see the world differently, even like not talking about North and South, but as one world, things like that. Um, you know, it changes how we view things if we if we even change how we speak. Um, and um, I guess the power international organizations have and the fear of letting go of this power. Um, our approach to risk also was discussed, not just it seems that we are we downstream our risk, um, safeguarding, uh, financial, etc., down to the local partners and even using the word down is wrong i would i would suggest um but that we downstream our risk and and then the capacity building um it, for local partners on a framework that doesn't make sense in their context etc okay um 
uh, obviously um, another thing to change, and this came out really strongly in our group, was our approach to global citizenship education, even as a DOCUS network, as INGOs, um, are we really uh, encompassing it? And in some cases, some organizations uh, do global citizenship very well, but they do it in silos. So like the lessons in one part of the organization may not even necessarily translate across into program implementation or project implementation. Um, in terms of obstacles, um, the word that was used um, was, you know, um, almost like that we're numb as we're numb to change. We have a collective apathy. Um, it takes time to change. It takes space. Um, do we take enough time and space for this change? Do we just meet once a year and have these wonderful conferences and do nothing in between? Um, you know, this, this, this was part of it. Um, and, you know, um, I suppose then other obstacles include how we're structured you know, how we compete amongst each other for funding, how we measure success by targets that are kind of a bit convoluted, results-based management, whose results are they? Um, you know what I mean? Are they people that we work with involved in all of these as we make the applications to donors even? Um, and um, we don't, I suppose, as a sector, always recognize our power when it comes to speaking to donors. Um, and maybe we should do more collective uh, discussions with donors. Um, then I, I suppose the, you know, um, there was uh, some comments like it's okay to do nothing in a country. So to make ourselves unemployed as such, uh, as in organizations now. Um, and even talking about obstacles to participation um, was like reflecting our conservative nature as a sector. I mean, participation should be, you know, paramount i suppose was the was was the was the feeling um then in terms of the donor some people felt that donors were well ahead in that like let's say irish aid are now you know not demanding but requiring localization others uh, feel that you know does the donor really have an understanding of um partnerships at all um and that we need to educate donors um, in terms of, I think I might have covered everything there in the sticky notes. Um, then in terms of what success looked like, um, basically we agreed that it's not for us to decide. Um, like who, who is at the table, even what the table looks like. Um, you know, um, do, do we as a, a group of people sitting around here determine that or if we were truly participatory, um, would, we, would we have a different answer? Um, and like many people uh, talked about, you know, we, we want to go like we're very process orientated. Do we have a destination yet? We may not. We may not know what it looks like. Um, and the, a, a real feeling about not talking about north and south, but on one world interdependent, how we're all one human population. Um, and again, the emphasis on global citizenship education. Mm -hmm. That's all from us. If anyone else in the group wants to add, if I've mixed up any of the stick. <laughs> Forgive me, um, I just find it hard to read off the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, great. Any, any others who would like to jump in? Um, I have a couple of reflections <laughs> on this. Uh, great. So you really kind of, um, yeah, interrogated what, what, what it means in terms of inclusion of groups and things. But what's really interesting from your group also is that reflection on the internal, in terms of our own attitudes and behaviors, right? Which also drives this thing. So um, if you talk about, you know, the, the, the global citizenship kind of um, idea, do we really reflect on our own power, our identity and how that is structured, you know, how it's structured in, uh, uh, in terms of prejudice, in terms of um, inclusion, exclusion, all of that. So you know, if you want to really make a change, that has to be at the start actually <laughs> for the reflection on what needs to change. So something that is really, really key. Um, and then, you know, it's really interesting you talk about the donors, right? Um, because I think uh, us working with donors, I just want to bring some experience in um, because quite a number of donor administration staff have never, had the connection with local organizations, sometimes they don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I do 
know that um, INGOs can be kind of the intermediary that things get lost mm. in translation. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's, there's also a need for, you know, a direct access between the donors and local partners uh, regularly so they could hear, right, from, from the local organizations about how things are going. They can also then uh, shift uh, some things to the donor, not only the INGOs who do the advocating. So just to keep that in mind as well, because sometimes the direct voices make more impact. When you hear a story from Sharon, it makes much more impact than if they hear it from you, for example, or the INGOs, right? Um, yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And this thing about risk has come up a lot in other discussions. Next, please. Okay, funding and finances, you've been prolific. <laughs> I see this is a very active group. Uh, please uh, share with us. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Smriti. Um, yeah, we were funding and finance and um, we gauged ourselves between one and two. So there's a lot of work to do in this area. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, we did good balance in our group, I would say across the sector in Ireland. Um, so, so what needs to change? We spoke a little bit about the commitments or the, the targets from the grand bargain. So we asked, was this 25% equitable as, as far as the target is concerned um, in terms of funding uh, local partners? Um, we felt it was a much broader issue than just INGOs versus NGOs. And we have to take into account government and the UN structure as well within the discussion. Yeah. Um, compliance came up around uh, moving funds um, into partnerships and the obligations to the donors and they need to embrace the risk. So again, kind of some of the, these issues were touched on earlier. Um, and the need for true partnership rather than just subcontracting, mm -hmm. uh, filling gaps that one another have mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. um, also around civil society is not the only actor we work with. Um, there's the private sector, but localization tends to focus on the local civil society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a conversation of like funding. It's always about donors. Who has the money? Follow the money. Um, so the donors are becoming increasingly risk averse, but they talk a language of localization. And we do welcome yeah, USA, FCDO and USAID and Irish Aid really trying to um, enable the environment for more focus to go um, to, the, to the south. Um, um, one of our colleagues shared, you know, this target, which was uh, set about with the grand bargain for 25%. To date, only 3% of funds globally go to the south, to local partners. And this is shocking. So we had some people in our group that said we were, weren't even at one. <laughs> so we ended up putting it between one and two. Um, uh, donors USAID FCO again about talking about investment partnerships, strategic interests, mm -hmm. but using the language of localization, but the practice is not clear. Um, local partners should not just be an extension of the INGO, so you know that mirroring each other are set up to deliver the actions, you know, and not looking at their strategic value mm -hmm. and their role in the community. Um, we had a big discussion around the indirect cost recovery um, you know all local partners they can't be sustainable they need to get a share in those ICO costs and that's always a bone of contention between the uh, INGOs and the NGOs um, also the we, we did that one um, ongoing um, are you going to fund activities are you going to look you know, if you're only doing activities and not funding capacity building and their strategic plans, you know, it's really important to look at the long term institution to give them that and not necessarily handle holding, but facilitating that process um, and kind of um, enabling that sustainability for them to grow. Uh, so, so much focus is on, you know, in terms of finance and fun, um, you look at some of the architecture. Uh, there's a lot of focus on finance, audit, risk, you know, in terms of your structure. And that actually takes you away from your program quality, you know, when everything is around, manage the risk around the funds, the finance, but actually we might be missing the bigger picture there. 
So what would it look like? Uh, we did get to this. Um, and it depends on the model and how the NG NGO engages or the INGO engages with localization, depending on what model. It could be advocacy, it could be operational, it could be humanitarian. And the context can't really, we, can't, we have to talk about the context as well because it does, it does uh, make a difference. Um, so how to, how to, in terms of what it looks like, how to support local NGOs fundraising within the countries themselves. And you can see that more civil society in Asia. You can see that happening more and more and help enable them to build up their own reserves and also for them to have choices. So at the moment, their choices are so limited. So we would see success in maybe even NGOs, national NGOs, local NGOs, being able to refuse funding, you know, not having to go with certain donors that are very restrictive, their way or the highway. And it was also encouraged that maybe a research idea that a donor could fund um, an organization in the globe so without checks and balances to see you know that build that trust in that and to see what that model would look like um, and there I think I said as well INGOs being invited to contribute to local NGO strategies rather than just project funding you know very time bound three months six months year deliver out gone you know um, so we had a really good discussion and you know, we tried to capture it there. Great, uh, really very rich huh? um, in terms of what you've come up with. And I think um, that thing about purpose, uh, it, what really comes out is, <laughs> are, we, um, are we projectizing everything because that's what we get the money for? Or are we asking what, it, what, need, what are the needs in that society? How do you want to work with us? And then the funding comes in, right? Then, and how to facilitate that. Um, a couple of things on funding, um, which are really, really key that I hear so often. One thing, of course, is about the percentage, but actually this 25%, it more comes from the humanitarian sector. So personally, I would say if you're working with development, that should go up drastically, right? It should, and and it shows if you if you're only hitting one or two percent, then there's there's a really big issue. Um, so your your gauge on the this score is is pretty accurate, right? Um, but how are you measuring it in terms of transparency? Uh, is there transparency in your reporting of how much actually goes to the uh, to your partners? What is the you know um, overhead cost that's going? Because all of this will help you to measure whether you're making any progress on this or not. And sometimes I get a bit um, worried when uh, organizations say, "Oh well, it's it's our donor, it's the donor. That's why we don't give them IRC, you know, the the overheads." But actually, if you were really an equitable partner you would be straight away saying, ah, we need to share the cost because we know that you need uh, funding to maintain yourself. Um, conversation around salaries and staff, for example, right? Or Sharon brought that in. Do you have that conversation? Um, you know, are they being exploited? I'm going to put that word in exploitation really this is how they're describing it you're exploiting them for cheap labor think about that because i think some of you work on forced labor and rights and all of those things but do you think about the rights of your partners really need to reflect on that um and lastly i think really important thing also is you said about the fundraising right how do you um, how do you help them to start thinking about their own fundraising in their own environment? Right, that's really important. But the other part of that is you should also think about stop fundraising in their space because that means there's only limited, you know, there's limited mm -hmm. space. And if you start fundraising in that country, I know in India and some other places, it shrinks the space for them. So think about that as well, because here it's really about the balance and it does, it really does harm to local civil society when that happens. So you need to have, you know, a bigger understanding about, you know, that, that environment and how you can help in terms of financing and even maybe access to private funding and how to access that as well. There are different ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, good. So let's move on to the next group. 
Okay, so for capacity, I'm really curious to know where you're at. Wow, three. Okay. Well, yes. So we positioned ourselves in three, but uh, we had quite a bit of a discussion around that because we recognize that there are organizations that are much stronger in uh, terms of capacity than others. Mm -hmm. So we kind of try to have a cautious middle there. Okay. But obviously, uh, discussing that, uh, it's really difficult to put one number on it. Um, and I was quite surprised, actually, because a lot of the discussion we had just now is very similar to what we heard from uh, finance and funding. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what needs to change, the first thing that we were talking about is um, sharing of core costs or overhead um, so that local partners are enabled to um, invest in the capacity development that they think is necessary, but also retain uh, staff that, you know, um, on, on the salary that they need, for example. Yeah. So to uh, keep the capacity within uh, local organizations or local partners. Um, we were also talking about moving away from a co-implementation to more of a co-design or core uh, co um yeah, no co-design uh, process, really. So allowing partners to identify what they want and what they need rather than um, telling them what we think they need. Mm. Uh, and in line with that, also planning for growth beyond the project cycle. So quite often we would see a specific need that we think is necessary um, to or a gap that we think is necessary to bridge for that particular project of one to three years rather than... Um, I suppose looking into the organization as such and we, how we can strengthen the organization and almost prepare an exit plan so that they might be able to function without us in the future. Um, and the last thing in terms of what needs to change is we need to start or recognizing, I suppose, that um, capacity development has to work both ways. So it's not only us telling local partners what they um, might be able to upskill on, but also the other way around that we have to recognize there are things that we don't fully understand and we have to upskill ourselves to better support the local partners. Um, I think that's mainly it on what needs to change in terms of obstacles then. Um, we think there is a greater need for flexibility in the budgets. It's quite often really challenging to say before a project starts what type of capacity development might be necessary three years down the road or even two years down the road. Um, and it's difficult or quite often donors wouldn't accept huge changes in, in budgets later on. So um, that's a bit of an obstacle that we identified. Um, and there are a lot of requirements and very different requirements from different donors. Um, so we found that it's really difficult to, um, I suppose, upskill local partners in being able to comply with all of those donor requirements. Um, so we were thinking about um, there needs to be some sort of better coordination between donor requirements. And someone brought up an idea of a compliance passport so that instead of needing to fulfill certain requirements for each different donor um, to have some sort of uh, overarching compliance passport that said that organization is strong enough to manage their finances, to manage their project cycle, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And finally, looking into successes, we ran a bit out of time, um, no but the first thing or the most impactful one, I suppose, is that uh, success is really there if INGOs don't need to be present in country anymore. If we only sit um, in Europe, in the US, wherever it might be, and um, support local partners without having to have a presence on the ground. Mm. Um, we were also talking about um, a world in which we don't have to, or we don't see the need to develop local capacity, um, for example, the, um, the example was brought up with uh, English speaking lawyers uh, that in a country, the entire legal system works through English and there aren't enough English speaking lawyers to support people. Um, so, but they might have the skills in their local languages so that the system or the entire environment, I suppose, um, is set up in a way that we can enable the local capacity that exists rather than um, right. imposing something else that they have to develop on. Um, and then the last thing, unfortunately, we get, didn't get to uh, discuss that in full. A change in the funding model would be net, or would look or would be a success. Uh, Finola, I'm not sure if you're on the call at the moment. Uh, if you just want to come in and uh, finalize that thought. Well, we had just said that you know there's so much around the the whole funding, um, and obviously, if uh, you know capacity 
has the strength and capacity already, then, you know, <laughs> partly it's about our role, but it also the ability to fund partners directly. And of course, that's there in our sector, but it's a very slow moving target. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. So great, uh, great start to this discussion. Um, so the other question then I had is, you know, who defines capacity, right? Do we really recognize what they have, or are we looking for what, uh, and, and I think Sharon said it, do we want a mirror image of ourselves or do we value uh, for them, uh, or, you know, for their own thing as well? So that's really, really important. And, and um, when you do capacity assessments, is it two way, yours and theirs, or is it only one way? So that's, uh, that's really interesting as well to think about. Um, okay, uh, let's go on to the next one because we, you know, need to get on with the time. So let's let's think what's what else is coming up. Great. Hi. So um, I was looking after the coordination mechanism group. Um, so we had a quite a long discussion about the the ranking, and we we agreed on a two point five. We were closer to two, and then. We had a more optimistic uh, input from one of our participants, so we, we agreed on 2.5, but a lot more to be done, but there was some optimism within that 2.5. So um, that was the consensus that we came to. So then around what needs to change, I think um, we, we had a, a great discussion overall, um, but we, we talked about the fact that um, really it's a, it's a very cultural thing. It's, it's, it's how INGOs sort of decide that, that the players around the table and the big INGOs around the table and the big donors that that is the way that we should do that's the way that, that we should do our work and that is leading to the exclusion of southern voices the local voices often the exclusion of women diversity all of the knowledge and expertise that we all know and value um that that that, that is missing um with the way that we are are coordinating um with with the, the the big players around the table um it's often the the power dynamics that are at play around that big table that lead to the lack of the the local voices that are there so um clearly they're the things that need to change um the obstacles that we 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 noted um and there are many um but budget came up a lot the the cost literally the logistics of um local partners attending these kind of meetings. The location of these meetings often in the capital cities as opposed to um, more locally. Um, safety came up as an issue, safety for, for women um, particularly. That idea of will this particular meeting be a safe space for me to attend and um, will, I, will I feel intimidated when I go there? Will my voice actually be heard? Will I be respected? I haven't been invited before so right. am I, is it just a tick box exercise that I'm going? Mm -hmm. um, and the the jargon and the lingo that that we use uh, at these fora is that um it's, it's an obstacle for for local local groups to attend um what would success look like this is a really interesting discussion a couple couple of key points came out one, one of them was around the need to educate donors uh, this came up in the, the second group as well to educate donors as to, our, our donors um as to how localization is practically as, as to how we're trying to implement implement localization practically so that they don't create more obstacles for us to try and do um, localization the way we're trying to do it. And the other really key thing that came up here was that we, as the INGOs who are also sitting at this table, don't let's not forget we're we're the ones that are there often and the local partners aren't, that we need to be the advocates yeah. for the local partners. We we can say if local partners are not present, why are they not present? Mm -hmm. What are the what is the um, what are the conditions that we as INGOs can put in place to make sure that they are? Are we in the capital? Could we be more local? Are we in the local language? Can we bring our interpreters instead of them bringing theirs? Um, can we provide the the finance? So it's sort of like we, we should be the advocates for the local partners if 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 they're if they're not there, and right. to to insist that we consistently check in. As to why they're why local partners are not there if they're not, and to to show um, our understanding of how vital it is that that they should be there. 
Great. Thank you very much. Really, really rich. And we've got it all on here so people can also have a look at it afterwards, the other groups. Um, next, please, another, uh, the next group. And if you can pick up uh, a few key things, um, because we, what we will do afterwards is also look at, you know, and you, you already talked about it, uh, what can we do jointly in terms of advocacy so, uh, and some of the collective stuff. So this group here. Thanks, Smriti. And I will, I'll just pick a few key points rather than going through each question yeah. necessarily. Um, I think we acknowledged, so our, our, we were looking at um, policies and standards and we scored two, even in the context that some of the organizations represented in our group were really looking and had been for some time at policies becoming more locally led, but still we scored the, um, we scored around at two. Um, there was acknowledgement that standards and accountability have to exist and that they can be beneficial, but a real focus in the what needs to change was on the how, mm -hmm. how it's done and, and with engagement and locally led. And we had a lot of conversation about power imbalances, which I think have been referenced in the previous groups. Um, in looking at how we would overcome obstacles, we talked about, though the points were made about a shift away from an accountability lens to a governance lens. But even within that context, focusing on governance standards that are locally appropriate, not externally um, driven. Yeah. And that led on to, I think, a conversation almost about the softer part, like uh, allowing more time for real engagement. Mm -hmm especially at the project design phase, which I think is captured there, and maybe linked in with the co-design that was mentioned in a previous group in group four. Yeah. And Good. the simple but underused um, technique of really listening and deep listening being one of the things that would bring about change. Um, and I think then just finally that one of the factors that we thought, would, that how, how we thought success would look, would be away from this very policy or standard driven project based type of funding mm. um, and to be looking more at local needs and flexible funding with complementary international support but less of this rigid focus on project funding Great. so that's a brief summary because I know that there's time limits great <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much for that and you will have more more chance to look into this in in a collective uh, discussion next uh, so the last one, please. Okay. Thank you. That's visibility and sharing credit, uh, giving credit to the partners. So I think we rated ourselves between three point five and four, uh, in average. Um, there were there were different um, experiences. Um, some. Uh, had more progress to do, but I think there were very good experiences also shared. So that's why we rated. Uh, in average, quite well. Um, sorry, I just go to my own dashboard to see a little bit better. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, that's about visibility. So what we said is, we 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 were looking at two things. I think how to raise the voice of the people we serve. How could we uh, let our partners contribute to the good uh, to 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 the visibility and communication side of things? How can we get, give um, partners uh, visibility on our websites? Um, also representing them on social media, uh, local partners um, really being uh, involved in in drafting uh, uh, content. Now we also looked at. Um, actually the local partners being involved in decision making and the choice of of um, engagement i mean how how do we the, the the way the projects are designed the way uh, the meetings are organized um give them the responsibility to our partners in the programs also in the management really and 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 the power this powerful decisions mm -hmm. and also let them uh, monitor us um peer to peer monitoring for us was also part of it Okay. Um, and um, yeah, the the funds and lack of funds, lack of unrestricted funds, lack of uh, overheads for ourselves that 
that we can share because we are also stretched. Um, so the partners might not have the, the, the cameras, the, the funding uh, is not there for the visibility part, but as well the, the capacity building, maybe they don't know how to really, um, what, what is suitable for the audience we try to target. So yeah, but I think overall, what we wanted really to give as message more than just raising voice of, of partners. Um, of course, we can do probably actions, but also was to give the partners the power more in the decision making and um, influencing what we are doing. Great, great. Really good, good reflections here as well on, on the visibility. What I, what I suggest now is that we go into seven groups, but now you think about collectively what you can do together, right? And um, we're going to give you uh, 15 minutes uh, to do that, to just, and this is just a start, right? This is just to say, this is a, just the start of the journey. Uh, so it will be good to see how you can think about uh, collective action. Okay, okay. so, um, I didn't want to go through kind of um, each and every one, but I just wanted to, um, yeah, just some key ideas that might have come up uh, quickly. And then other, of course, it's on our, um, it's on the Google um, document already, what you have discussed. But was there anything that was striking to you in the discussion you had about collective action? Just uh, unmute or raise your hand and, just share a couple of things from your group. So a couple of key actions perhaps that you may have identified. If I may, if I may yeah, I, just uh, in, in our session, I, I was taken with uh, this idea of not using the word partner, but member always coming up. It was the idea of equal membership, uh, because there's this sense of unequal partnerships, uh, but trying to get people who are on board and taking that a little bit further, was that would include the donors as well as all the, recip the line of recipients all the way down, uh, wherever. But this idea of member uh, and having an equality there and possibly a code of, be, of uh, practice for all members from you know whoever they are, be it donors or whatever. Yeah. Right, thank you. So that real collective action, right, in, in the broader sense. Yeah, we, we, we spoke about language, solidarity and member coming up in that. And the other thing was just the complexity of this, that we challenged ourselves that sometimes when we came up with ideas, like we said, oh, do we have a code of conduct to try and set standards? And then we went, oh, but does that turn us back into compliance, which we said is a barrier, you know, and kind of, you know, going, okay, none of these things are easy. Um, and one other area that came up was something that we can do and should do is donor advocacy. Some of us are donors ourselves, but then also donors is in our own donors. And if compliance, risk matrix, all of these spaces, the way we program are barriers, we need to speak loudly and clearly to our donors. And the opportunity through DOCUS is to speak to Irish Aid very clearly on this, because there are real challenges there and some of the models there that really are obstacles to us in this. And the protection of doing this as DOCUS yeah. together as a group rather than also individually. Yeah, great. So that the whole reporting part as well, right? Um, which makes it so difficult for partners. Others? Jenny? Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, in our group, we were also talking about um, any type of advocacy that we want to do needs to be informed by our local partners. So there was a suggestion around um, creating maybe an advisory panel of local members or local partners so that um, we, I suppose, co-design any, any initiative and don't just sit here and decide it amongst ourselves. Brilliant. Great. That's a very good idea. So that's a real, real good collective action. Anybody else would like to? Lucia? Maybe around a collective action and with the donors and our role to, we're, we're lucky in a sense that Irish Aid is advocating for 
better localization stronger and maybe um, support them to be um, a leader of donors in that area. They, they have such influence and that we could collectively feed into that um, from our experience. So I think there's an opportunity there. And also we were talking about the decision makers within our own organizations, especially for the cost share, because there is competition of resources and um, so we have to as well advocate or really help people understand what it means by not giving that cost share to local partners because they just see money going, but they're not understanding that it's not sustainable unless they do that. Mm -hmm. So I think we, because it's an in, it can be within the organizations as well, the members that we really need to try and um, shed light on that, what it would mean. So, Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so there's been some things in the chat as well um, on, on different suggestions. Um, I would say you need to think about, uh, you know, uh, adopting a, a, a framework which will help you to move forward in these different things. So I wanted to do a poll <laughs> to find out um, from these seven dimensions, which ones do you think um are the kind of say you would prioritize so if you can uh, go to the mentimeter which uh, you know you've got the link here in the in the chat and look at you know you've been in the seven dimension kind of um discussion which ones would you prioritize because that will also help your groups to um wow look at that <laughs> quality of relationship Excellent. Visibility, capacity. I love this tool. <laughs> it's so nice to see it live going up and down, right? Keep going. Okay. So it's really interesting because normally when you um, look at the quality of relationship, it has a very strong um, link to funding and financing. Because if you make decisions together, right, um, and you look at the whole thing of equity and stuff, then already, you know, you would start uh, do or funding and things in a different way. So um, at the moment, right, I see quality of relationship as the first, funding and financing, and visibility and sharing as kind of key things that are coming up um, that perhaps you can start working on. Um, so I'll just give you an example. The Dutch Relief Alliance in, in, in the Netherlands, so the uh, uh, Dutch MFA give them funding, and they work together, and they've adopted Seven Dimensions Framework to help them make real progress. And they, they come up with the indicators uh, to help them to measure where they're, they're getting there. So you can use the, and I think uh, you will be getting the handout that has been produced uh, from this. You can look at the, um, the measurement and, and see how you're getting there. So it's a, it's a way of really um, clearly making some indicators and measuring yourself and how, is, how you're getting there over the years. So it's really important to have some measurable indicators as well so that you know and create a strategy around it. Um, I can also share with you some of their documents so you can see how they have done it. And then, then they also lobby uh, the Dutch government. So similar thing to what you're saying as well. Um, you can stop sharing the, uh, the Mentimeter and we'll share that with you as well, the results. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for taking active part in, in these exercises. I hope it's helped to, to ground the whole discussion on localization because um, I know it, you know it can be really a bit fuzzy <laughs> up there. So I hope it's really helped you to think more um, you know, structurally what you can do, what are the aspects that you must look at. Um, and here it's saying it shouldn't be uh, lost meaning in application, right? Um, 
So there are some chats here and do have a look at the chats that are going on as well, because that also helps uh, the discussions. Can you stop sharing the screen and, and the scores? Um, and I think we need to go to, okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hand over back to to you to uh, to take yeah. us to the closing. Thank you very much, everybody, for the active participation. Thanks very much, Smriti, and thank you all for the active uh, participation. Um, we have a couple of things um, just to mention. I have we have two more questions on the Mentimeter, so I'll get you to log back into that um, just to do a, do a very quick snapshot uh, for yourselves of just how you found um, today's session. It was an attempt to try to bring forward this topic of locally led um, development and in, in all its different guises and see how we can actually move this very uh, important topic forward. So if people do want to click on the uh, Mentimeter there, you can go back to the poll and there should be, there's just two questions to click on. Um, just to be able to give a short, sharp reflection on, on your um, your take from today. Uh, let me see. Just the one question, Jane Ann. Oh, it's just one question? Yeah, just the one, yeah. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so just um, and, you know, whether or not um, today's discussion will support you in your work in the future. And I think it's really just, for us as Docus, it's important to gauge if we're kind of hitting the right note, I think, with, with our members to see how, you know, if we are in fact supporting you um, in your work um, and adding value to uh, to this conversation for you. So, um, and uh, it's just to get an idea of that uh, from yourselves. Um, just while, before we close, um, just a couple of other things I would like to mention. Um, I just would like to extend a huge thank you to the team. There's a, there's a command and control center in, in our um, office at the moment in the boardroom. Um, so there's been a lot of work has gone into uh, making today so successful, but also to those who took on the role of project lead or scribes as well. It's been, it made the whole process extremely fluid and it really added value to the conversation um, to be able to start it as we mean to go on, I think, and um, that everybody was so prepared and we were able just to delve straight into the issues as well. I think it made for a very uh, productive and engaging discussion. Um, there are loads of locally led development resources now on our website. You saw the, um, the great video at the beginning um, of our members and each of our members have actually, that was the short version. Uh, I think we have 13 videos from our members who are describing some of their work and their approach towards locally led development. So I hope that's a resource to you also to get a better understanding of where some of the other members are and perhaps where are some of the, co the common themes that perhaps you might be working on that others might be working on as well and where um, there might be opportunities for um, working or coordinating together. Um, we will also be sharing an evaluation form um, after this, um, and we hope that you will complete that evaluation and let us know in a little bit more detail um, of what you think. And um, I think that just to mention, this is the start of the conversation. Uh, we will take all the work that's been done in the last couple of hours and bring it together. And hopefully, I'm very optimistic that some key themes from today have emerged in terms of how we can take this forward. And we'll come back to you um, as the members to say, you know, is this how you want to progress? Are these the areas where you do see an added value of convening under the DOCUS umbrella and progressing this topic of uh, locally led development? And I think that today has helped us bring that a step closer. And um, so a big thank you um, to all. Um, I don't know if we can see. Yeah, that's, uh, if there's anything further to add from the team or from Morgan uh, before we close the session, you're okay, Morgan? All good. All good, great. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I hope it wasn't too long on Zoom, but uh, I think it was really uh, great to have your participation. So I hope to see you soon in person, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye, bye, all. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.